So be praying for her, and then his dad's name is Mark. And so if you could pray for them, that God would touch them in a special way. Would you take the word of God, please, and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. I'd like to read just seven verses uh, this evening. And I want to talk to you tonight about the simplicity of the Christian life. Um, oftentimes we make things more complicated than they need to be, don't we? Um, I'm, I'm constantly burdened about witnessing to people and talking to people, and sometimes I feel like I overcomplicate the gospel. Uh, the Bible says that the, the gospel is, is simple, it's the simplicity of the gospel, uh, so much so that even a child can understand. And so we must have the heart that our Savior has in the sense of delivering things or communicating things in simplicity. And really, when we look at Christian life, uh, it is a life of simplicity. Uh, we are a busy people. Uh, we are complicated people because of the things we put in our life. Uh, but the desire that every believer should have is that of simplicity. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse number 1, says, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin in Christ, uh, to Christ, sorry. But I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you received another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with me, with him, sorry. For I suppose I was not a wit behind the very chiefest apostles. And though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. Have I committed offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted because I have preached you the gospel of God freely? In this setting of scripture, we see Paul asserting himself, if you will, as almost like a father figure. Um, this is not the first time Paul has done this, uh, and it won't be the last time. Matter of fact, he does it again almost in Galatians. But Paul is trying to express a concern that he has. And it's found in the third verse. And at the end of the verse, he's worried about them being tricked or beguiled is the word he used. So your minds, he says, should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Every great leader in history has communicated with simplicity. You think of people like Winston Churchill. As a matter of fact, Winston Churchill uh, was known for his speeches, though uh, I, as you study him, you'll learn that he practiced those speeches and say them, and he wanted to be able to say them well. He didn't want to stammer and stutter as he uh, gave these speeches. He is, had an incredibly powerful delivery in the things that he said. So Winston Churchill was a man who was known for giving clear speeches and also with the way that he said things that he said. Another person who is often quoted and recognized for their speeches is John F. Kennedy. Now, you may not uh, agree with policies and things of that nature, but one of his most uh, quoted speeches is that of his inaugural speech, uh, which he spent months writing. Kennedy's ability to speak as if he was having an authentic conversation with you by, by yourself was one of his many talents. Do you know, now you're going to chuckle at this, um, and I got this from a top 10 list of most famous communicators, and I had to add him because you'll get a chuckle at this, but you'll understand it as soon as I say. In that top 10 list, Mr. Rogers made the top 10 list of most effective communicators to children and adults. He had a way to be able to explain some very in-depth subjects very plainly very clearly. Now, in fact, some of his videos now are surfacing again because they're so simply, simplistic on what is a boy and what is a girl. And uh, it's sad we have to revisit those to, to solidify in our mind what a boy and what a girl is. But Mr. Rogers was a very effective communicator. These men were effective because they employed the tactic of simplicity when they were trying to communicate things. Now, you think about this. Jesus was probably one of the most complex people in the world, but yet he delivered a message that could astound doctors, and yet children could walk away understanding what he was saying. He was a very effective communicator. He was effective because of the fact he was teaching, not only with authority and great power, 
but with simplicity. In the auditorium today, we have people that are north of 80 years old, and we have some that are just barely over a year old, and some that haven't made their break into the world yet. So there's quite a bit of diverse group in this room. So I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but as a preacher or a teacher, our job is to effectively communicate things that will feed somebody at Brother Arb's level, but also feed somebody at William and Wyatt's level. It is the ability that we're supposed to be able to give the message of the gospel and the truth of the Bible with clarity, and the way you do it is through simplicity, not trying to overcomplicate things. Now, each one of these men were not simply communicators of speech, but they were communicating a message. When we read the Bible, we preach the Bible, we're not just giving words, we're not just reading the Bible, we're trying to communicate a message. We want you to walk away with truth that you can apply in your own life. Amen. Now, the message Christ has given to his people is that the Christian is not, in the life is not meant to be difficult. It's meant to be simple. We often say the Christian life is hard, and it is, but it should not be. And what do I mean by that? I mean that the hardness of the Christian life often comes by the complexity that we bring from making things complex. Let me, let me give you an example by this. There are some famous hymns that we sing, all right? It goes like this. Have thine own way, Lord. Okay, that's a simple love to live God's way. Where he leads me, I will follow. I say yes, Lord, rest to your will and to your way. Another song, I surrender all. Now, this is a simplistic Christian life. So where does the complexity come? Well, let's put those songs into what we're really saying. Have mine own way, Lord. That's complex. <laughs> That's difficult in the Christian life. Where he leads me, I will wander. I say maybe, Lord, Maybe to your will and to your way. I surrender some. This is where the complexity comes in. God has a recipe, a divine recipe of simplicity, of just listening and obeying and following God, what God says. The complexity and the confusion comes when we start altering it to our own ways, our own whims. It was once said that complexity borders on confusion. A good leader is, is understandable, but he is also Copyable. I know that's not a word, copyable, but that's the ideal. Pastor Sexton used to always say all the time, he says, I preach to be repeated. Not that he wants to, them to repeat what he's saying, but he wants the truth to resonate so deeply, whatever he's saying, that it will touch your heart and the Holy Spirit will use it so you will repeat it to somebody else. Do you know the effectiveness of Charles Spurgeon was in his members? It, it not, now listen, Charles Spurgeon was the prince of preachers. However, if he preached, nobody ever went out and talked about what the Lord was doing and the power of the message. Nobody ever know. So how that church grew as much as it is, is that um, Charles Spurgeon preached with the power of God and in the spirit of God. But then what happened was the people came out and said, you have got to hear this message. You've got to hear my pastor preach. He is filled with the Holy Spirit and God is using him in a mighty way. Matter of fact, I remember hearing a story, uh, reading, reading from his uh, biography that uh, Charles Spurgeon was giving a tour and said, hey, let me take you to the hottest place in the building. And he opens up the door and, and it was to the boiler room and they're like, this is weird. Why would he do that? But then they go into another portion of the boiler room and there were a bunch of men praying for the service. He said, this is the most powerful and hottest room in this building. I would not be able to do what I do without these men praying for the message and for God to work. Don't diminish the power of your prayers for your pastor, Amen. that God would do a great and mighty work. Paul shows us here, and I want to convey to you tonight that the God means for the Christian life to be lived in simple faith and simple trust, simple service. And Paul had a genuine fear. He says in verse 3, but I fear lest by any means as a servant beguiled Eve through the, his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now, notice that Paul does not say what they are corrupted to, but what they're corrupted from. Now, I believe that the reason it's stated this way is because when we are corrupted from the simplicity of Christ, 
it leads to all other corruption. What I mean by it is oftentimes we are a tit for tat kind of thinking or this is for that kind of thinking. Meaning that if we do this, it will create this. If we do this wrong, it will create that wrong. And that's not always the recipe. However, when we find ourselves corrupted from the simplicity of Christ, it leads to all sorts of corruption that could happen. The corruption from the simplicity of the gospel will lead us to corruption in our own personal life. To escape the simplicity of the Christian life is to invite corruption into our life. It's interesting that the very first question that is entered in the Bible is that of confusion. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat the tree of the garden. Here's this question introduced, and it wasn't to promote knowledge or to promote wisdom. It was to promote confusion and destruction. Matter of fact, Paul will encourage Timothy to avoid such questions in 2 Timothy 2 and 23. He says, But fools and other questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. Be careful to get into battles with people on their biblical knowledge when all it does is gender more questions and create more confusion and really can fall into a harm of other people. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, as a father figure in great love. Like a father, he's trying to convey the simplicity of the Christian life. And how is that seen? We'll see it in a couple things. Number one, simplicity of love. Simplicity of love. The message that Paul is writing from and the place he's writing from is a place of love. Um, just like a father figure, we sometimes will tell our children things that are hard. And they may not want to hear it. Even as an adult, they may not want to hear those things. But if they can take a step back and say, this is my father who loves me. And maybe I ought to filter that conversation through that. And that's what Paul's saying. Look what he says. He starts off. He says, would to God, you could bear with me a little in my folly. All right? As a dad, I get this. Listen, I know you're an adult. I know you're doing things. And now we're starting to experience this. You know, Grace and Dave are adults. They're having children. Uh, uh, Danny and Olivia, they're married. And you have to figure out where's my place as a parent. You know, like I want to be a part of their life. I want to, but I have to be careful that I'm not trying to direct their life or, or dictate their life. But as a father figure, still, that's what Paul's saying. Hold on, we just, we just kind of, you know, deal with my folly. We just hear me out on this. It's really kind of, if you were to put it in layman's language, he said, we just hear me out on what I'm about to say. And again, that's coming from a father figure's heart as he's talking. So, what does the simplicity of love involve? It involves patience. Uh, Paul is displaying this righteous jealousy uh, for the people he loves, the people he has instructed, the people that he has helped uh, come to know Christ. And he wants them to just take consideration who he is and how he's been in their life and involved in their life. All this is, is seen through what Paul is saying and also what he is not saying by how he's saying it. Now, what does uh, love do in the life of believers? What does love do? And, and I want you to consider this too. Uh, it says in 1 Peter 4, 8, And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. And this is simply saying that be patient with some people sometimes. If you know they truly love you, hear them out. Hear what they have to say. The simplicity of life is if somebody is not, they're not trying to lead me astray. And in this case, Paul has never led these people astray. He's not led them into false doctrine. He's not led them into some kind of danger that wasn't outside the Lord. Matter of fact, he puts himself into danger and even has to tell people, hey, you know, like, don't tell me not to go someplace if I know the Lord wants me to go there. So it's that ideal of a father figure, I've never led you astray. I've never hurt you. I've never harmed you. I've never brought you into your life that would cause you to, to not have to believe me. I want you to consider that. I'm saying some things that might seem foolish to you or as he says near the... Uh, um, bear with me a little in my folly, and D, bear with me. So he is telling them, have some patience in all of this. Now, imagine the devastation that Paul was dealing with, watching those he led to Christ turn to someone else. And in fact, I'm going to tell you this as, as this father figure, as somebody who invests in people's life, when you watch people turn from you, it breaks your heart. It almost feels like they're turning your back, their back on you. Now, they may not be. I'm just telling you, you invest in somebody. And Paul, I can understand what he's saying. Like, listen, I've been here. I have invested in this. He goes on. He says, I've espoused you. In other words, I've led you to the relationship in Christ. And you're, you've turned your back to go listen to these guys that have nothing to do with you. That's heartbreaking. 
So he's saying, listen, this love just involves a little bit of patience. Just bear with me here. But it also involves perspective. Paul tells them very directly the part he had in their conversion. Look what he says. He says, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I, am pre- uh, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, Paul is not declaring he saved them or he had any saving power. But think about this. We had um, a friend of ours years ago that she tried to take credit for getting my wife and I together. Here's the funny thing. When she told, my wife told her that we were going to start dating, she says, you don't want to date him. He's gross. And she was kind of right as an unsaved man. But after we got married, oh yeah. I, oh, I set you guys up. No, you didn't. But in this case, Paul's telling the truth. He gave them the message. Matter of fact, he says, I think it's in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, I preach to you a message that I first have received. And so there's a personal investment there. Like I gave this message of the gospel and I showed you what Christ said and I, I'm a part of your life. You know, my best friend is Dave Wyrick. And I say that because there are people that I am closer to in this earth than Dave Wyrick, but he'll always be my best friend because he's the one that led me to the Lord. <laughs> you can, nobody can beat that, you know? Nobody can top that. So to me, that's the greatest friendship you can ever have. And you know, there have been times that Dave Wyrick has done things that I disagreed with and have frustrated me. But charity covers a multitude of sins. I love that man. And I will never, ever forget the fact that he took the time to preach the message faithfully as God led him to preach, took the time to lead me to the Lord, took the time to disciple my wife and I, took the time to be patient with me. That says a lot for me. And I can imagine how heartbroken he would be if I gave up on the Lord and quit serving the Lord. Why? Because there's a lot of investment there, a lot of love, a lot of prayer that went into our lives. And so Paul, I totally get this. Paul Smith, you have to understand it from my perspective. Like I had involvement in you coming to Christ. I have involvement in your life. Again, as a father, like that is a tough position. And all you parents that have watched your kids grow up, it's tough to say, you're making all your decisions on your own now. (laughs) It is difficult. Most times, thankfully, thankfully we haven't had any like, you know, huge knucklehead moments like where it like changed their life. But there are times you see your kids do stuff, you're like, eh, I wouldn't do it that way. But it's like, eh, whatever, it is what it is, right? I'm sure our kids watch us and go, eh, I wouldn't do it that way. But here's Paul saying, listen, I, I have brought you here. He says, I, uh, for I have espoused you to one husband. Now look at the responsibility, he says, uh, in the latter portion, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. There is this perspective. Now, Paul uses similar language in Ephesians chapter 5, doesn't he? Go with me, Ephesians chapter 5. Starting in verse number 25, we see similar language that Paul uses when speaking to husbands. In Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse number 25, Paul has already spoken to them uh, that they submit themselves one to another. He's already spoken to the wife and told her to uh, be in submission to her own husband as unto the Lord. And then he switches to the husband and he says, husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it, uh, present it to uh, himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So their responsibility, Paul says, hey, listen, I, 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 I gave you the information and you trusted Christ. I'm a part of that. And I want to take personal responsibility in this. I want you to know I'm invested in your life. I care about you. And here's the the simplicity of love is that that sometimes we get all complicated and and we start throwing things around like, oh, they don't know who I am. Well, I'm I'm now this way in my life. Hold on a second. If the simple fact is if they have never, they have not ever led you astray biblically, then why would they start today? And that's what Paul's trying to say, like, why would I start today starting to give you error or whatever? Because at the end of the day, it's not about so he can say it was about Paul, but he really truly is concerned about when they stand before God, how they're going to be presented. I know sometimes as a pastor, and I've seen in other things too, that people wonder the boundary lines that you have in their life. And I just want to let you know, as a pastor, my thought process is one day 
you are going to stand before God. And I want to do everything I can to help you stand before God without reproach and without all those things. Ultimately, that choice is yours. But sometimes you might see it as meddling or whatever. It is me seeing things or the Holy Spirit saying, hey, this is in their life. Do what you can to try to help them because one day they're going to stand before God in judgment. I want to help you. So I want you to keep that in mind, all right? Uh, and I'll do my very best not to cross that line of meddling, amen? But that also, the simplicity of love involves a pattern. Paul reflects and brings our mind back to the garden, doesn't he? He said, if there was this relationship that was really the closest relationship humankind has known as two people walking in the gar garden with the presence of God in a perfect environment with a perfect scenario, with the perfect woman and the perfect man, quote unquote, and they failed, and Satan was able to come in and deceive them. What makes us think that we can't be de deceived? And he wants them to understand that pattern. Nobody loved Adam and Eve more than God Almighty. Nobody. And yet somebody was able to come in, ask them one question, and it forever changed their life and ours too. So it involves this pattern. The pattern we see from their life is when we believe someone else besides God, we will suffer. So what's the simplicity of love? Trust God. <laughs> believe God. It's that simple. And follow people that follow God. Number two, the simplicity of the gospel. It says in verse number four, he says, for if he that cometh preaching uh, another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. So the simplicity of the gospel, it's found in preaching. Oh, listen, preaching is essential for our lives. God gifted people to preach and teach for a reason. So if God gifts certain men to teach and preach, that means the people that weren't gifted with that need the teaching and preaching. Where complexity comes in our life is when we get ourselves to a place where we say, I don't need the preaching. I only need it this many times a week, or I only need this, I only need it for this. I, oh, I know that, or I don't know that. One of the, the craziest things we can ever do is disconnect ourselves from the preaching, especially when it's a familiar setting of scripture, or you've been here for 9,000 years and a day, and this has been your church since, you know, Moses left the world, you know? That's tough. But you need a purpose in your heart to be connected to the preaching. Now, let me tell you what the goal of a preacher, what my goal is, a preacher is, all right? The goal of my preaching is not for you to say, wow, how did he get that? My goal, when I bring the Bible and preach the Bible to you, is for you to go, huh, how did I not see that? See, there's no extra revelation. <laughs> the Bible is the Bible. And the job of a preacher and teacher is not to try to blow your mind with our wisdom and knowledge, it's try to get you to a place to where the Bible seems uh, more simple in the sense you, to where you can understand the Holy Spirit can reveal these things where you say, oh, man, how come I didn't see that? To convey this, the simplicity of the gospel through preaching. Now, the message of the gospel is so simple, and Paul wants them to understand that if someone is preaching another Jesus and question that preacher. The Jesus that most people pre preach about today is not the Jesus of the Bible, Okay. When people go around and say, Jesus, he gets you. <laughs> no, Jesus saves you. <laughs> oh, my. To get away from the simplicity of preaching would be to corrupt preaching. Let's just say this. Health is simple. Disease is complex. Right is simple. Wrong brings about complexity and confusion. Paul encouraged Timothy not to get engaged in such debate because the devil likes to add complexity to the simplicity God has laid out. 1 Corinthians 1, 27, uh, but God hath chosen foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. There is a simple message that is preached, and that is Christ in him crucified. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, for I've determined no, uh, to not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. The simplicity of the message is the message of the gospel. This is what we're preaching. 
People are saved by the simple preaching of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 1.21, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believed. People want to be so smart and they want to know all these facts and all these figures and they want to know all this stuff. As a matter of fact, they're, they're so distracted by peripheral things that don't matter. I mean, some people will spend their entire life trying to figure out if David was taking a nap or he was using the bathroom in a cave. You want to have debates about that. Great, you want to know that? Know that. But why spend hours and hours debating something about something that has nothing to do with your salvation? So it's found in the preaching, but simplicity of the gospel is found in grace. The Bible tells us, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus on good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. What is God's grace? God's riches at Christ's expense. Our salvation is given by grace that we might live by faith. That grace was extended to us in a, uh, is, uh, and is displayed in the fact that we are God's quote-unquote workmanship that is only found in Christ Jesus. Now, there are only two messages of salvation. Don't, listen, listen to me first before you ask, all right? One is by grace and one is by works. One will save you, one will not. I know there's a bunch of messages and there's a bunch of packaged ways that religion places it, but there's only two ways. You're either getting saved through grace and faith in Jesus Christ or it's some sort of work. One saves you, one does not. As a matter of fact, this is a lot of what Paul talks about when he's dealing with these Judaizers and saying, man, you're really, you're com complicating the gospel. You're adding these things and uh, things of that nature on it. As a matter of fact, Proverbs tells us uh, that, that the way of sinful people, it's not easy, it's hard. Uh, as a matter of fact, people look at the Christian life and say, oh, it's so hard to live a Christian life. But my Bible says otherwise. Proverbs 13, verse 15 says, good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. How do I know this? You know, I run into people from high school, and uh, sometimes I run into people, and I look at them, and I say, man, I think to myself, I don't say this to them, I think to myself, man, life has been rough to you. I mean, they look like the Marlboro man that has aged, and life has been rough. Matter of fact, I've looked up a guy, I was uh, talking to somebody about, uh, uh, I was talking to Jeff yesterday, uh, went out to visit Jeff Patton yesterday, and uh, I was talking to him about a, a guy from, from elementary school. And I had lost touch with this guy. I haven't seen him, not like we were friends or anything, but I wanted to see what this guy looked like. I looked him up on Facebook and I thought, oh man. And I, I tell you, I'm not trying to profile people, but I look and I bet you I could describe some things that he has done in his life. And I'm, I'm going to guess and I'm going to be pretty accurate on these things. Sin has a way of reflecting it on people's bodies and things of that nature. So the, the ways of transgressors is hard. It's hard in your body. It's hard in your life. But it's, I want to say this as well. The grace that comes with the simplicity of the gospel can also transform somebody as well. Uh, uh, Steve Carrington, I think that's his name, he was one that started Reformers Unanimous. He was into all kinds of drugs and all kinds of crazy things, and he was doing all kinds of craziness. But then he got saved and gave his life to Christ, and, and you would look at him, and you would never know that was his past. God was gracious to him in that sense. Uh, had a beautiful wife, and they had five children, and uh, God was good to him in that sense. But it's found in grace. The simplicity is found in preaching. It's found in grace. It's also found in faith, found in faith. The simplicity of this life is not found looking for the next best thing or the next hot doctrinal topic. And Paul questions them about these things. He goes on and he says uh, in verse number, uh, in verse four, and he says, uh, comes preaching another Jesus. In other words, he's saying, is there another preacher? Another, another spirit? Another gospel? Really? Why? Why do we look for these things? Because we become dissatisfied with what we have. We become, become dissatisfied. That's why people buck against the old hymns because we've sung them for so many years. You might be vocally singing them, but are you singing them with your heart? Amen. I mean, you think about these words. They do not write words like this anymore, okay? And I'm not saying that some of the new stuff isn't good, but they don't write like that anymore. You know, I get it. Some of the words we sing, even Rock of Ages, had some things in there that, that you're like, we don't talk like it anymore. But let me just tell you, it's rich language. There's a rich message in it. I don't get on to where people say, well, a lot of these songs are the newer songs, all their testimony songs. Well, it is well with my soul. That's a testimony song. Yeah. You know, how great thou art. I guess that's a testimony of the Lord. But, you know, there are a lot of songs that we sing as testimonies in the hymns. But what happens is we look for, we're not happy with what we have. 
But it's the simplicity of the faith that God has established these things. God has established his word, his doctrine. I shouldn't always be looking for another preacher, another spirit, and another gospel. There is one gospel. There is one spirit. And anybody that's preaching Jesus Christ is the preacher you need to listen to. Amen? This is why discipleship is so important. It says later on, people will be given to itching ears. Ever learning, but never come to knowledge. People that want to be teachers, they don't want to be followers. It's dangerous. And the simplicity of life. Look at verse 5 through 7. For I suppose I was not wit behind the very cheapest apostles. Now, it's interesting. The simplicity of life is about direction. All right? Paul uses a tongue-in-cheek statement in verse number 5. The ideal is that Paul has uh, only preached, taught, lived one way. And he says in verse 5, he says, For I suppose I was not a wit behind the very cheapest apostles. He's almost saying in a way like, you know, I, I, Peter, James, John, yeah. And he's not being boastful. He's basically saying, we're preaching the same Jesus. Uh, we got converted the same way. So maybe they're looking at these other teachers. Oh, yeah, but I know you're preaching Jesus, but man, not like this guy. Oh, man, when he sets up and, you know, he's talking about this being filled with the Spirit thing. He gets up there and he's like, woo! Oh, man, he's just good to listen to. Man, you know, our preacher's old, old and dusty. That guy up here, man, he's got it. Oh, he's got to be filled with the Spirit because he's running around. He's jumping on the pulpit. He's screaming and spitting. He's talking. I don't know what he's saying. It must be that angel angelic tongue or something. But this is what people are looking for. We've had people walk in our doors and walk out of our doors because they didn't like our music. They want the praise and worship. They want to they wanna quiver in the liver. They want to hear somebody act like they're making out with the microphone when they're singing a song. I like the sensual stuff. When somebody sounds like they're being seductive when they're singing a Christian song, I've got a problem with that, you know? Again, I think there are some songs that are good that are new. Um, but there are a lot of songs that are not. I think some songs were created in great, uh, with good intentions, uh, but when the words, and this is what they always say, listen to the words. Okay, I'll listen to the words. Uh, there was a very popular song for a while, uh, called the reckless love of God. Well, God's love is not reckless. And uh, I know you may think it's reckless by him giving his son for people like ourselves, but it's not. It's the fact that he thought everything out from the very beginning, from the foundation of the world, he had a plan for sinful man, is what blows my mind, <laughs> that he would die for somebody such as myself. You change one word in that song, and it's a very good song. What I'm saying is, it's about direction, that Paul had always been focused towards one direction. Confusion comes when we cannot pick a direction to which we are going to travel. Okay, ready? I'm going to give a trigger warning right now. Is everybody ready? I want to give you an illustration. You're out with your spouse or whatever. Honey, where would you like to go to eat tonight? Oh, I don't care. You pick. It's getting me worked up already thinking about this. <laughs> no, no, I picked last time. Where do you want to go? Oh, I don't care. Wherever you want to go is fine. You pull into said restaurant. Oh, you want to go here? <laughs> Make up your mind. I asked you where you wanted to go. And you said you don't care. But when I make a choice, you say you care. Oh, man, I can feel my blood pressure going up. I had to calm down here. <laughs> and this is the ideal, that we create confusion or the lack of decision often creates conflict in that relationship. Paul was, had his mind set that this is the way I have served the Lord because this is what God saved me from. This is how I got saved. This is the message. I've always preached the same thing. The word for simplicity is singleness. One other word you can use for simplicity is singleness. James describes the danger of not using the singleness in James 1.8. It says the double my man is unstable in all of his ways. It means this man is constantly torn. Never make decisions. Do I go here? Do I go there? Well, I see what you're saying, but I see what you're saying. I, but I can hear from your, yeah, I understand. And they just don't ever know. Where do I stand? This is where the complexity is involved in our life. The simplicity is God said it. That's it. I'm going to believe God. I'm going to take him at his word. I've got to stay on that path at all times. And the world we live in now is, and it's always been like this, it just, it, to us it's work because the world we were born into is drastically changing. But the world that our parents was born into 
drastically was changing. And the world that their parents were born into were drastically changing. It's constantly getting worse. It's not getting better, by the way. There might be pockets of revival here and there, but it's on a trajectory somewhere. And I know where it goes, and it involves a hand basket, okay? But it's not getting any better. This idea of singleness, his life is to be not complex, but simple. Romans chapter 14, verse 5 tells us that every man, let him every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Fully persuaded that what God said is truth. First, uh, Second Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 12, you can turn back a couple pages if you'd like. Second Corinthians chapter 1 verse 12 says, For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in the simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. So he says that our rejoicing comes from simplicity and godly sincerity. And notice the contrast he makes, not with worldly wisdom. How many people will try to tell you what the Christian life is, but they don't use their Bible? How many people tell you who God is, but they don't use their Bible? How many people tell you what you believe, but they don't use the Bible? This is where confusion comes from. This is why you have pastors, like say this, and church leaders standing up in front of their church with a rainbow robe on preaching heresy. This is why you have people getting up here and preaching, not up here, <laughs> getting behind pulpits and preaching heresy because they're preaching a world's gospel in their own philosophy. But we must not do it with worldly wisdom or fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God that we have our conversation, our way of life, or the way we conduct ourselves in the world. So Paul says, when you think of Peter, James, and John, I, I'm right there with them. Not that he was boasting, but he's saying, basically, I have preached a message, I have lived a message. I want, let me tell you, the simplest way to live your life is a Christian 24 hours a day, seven a week. Where the Christian life becomes difficult and complex is when you're a Christian on Sunday while you're at church, Wednesday while you're at church, you're a Christian when you hang out with certain friends, or when you're at a Bible study. That's when the Christian life gets real difficult. You gotta remember who you are with people. Listen, I'm too lazy to be, be like be fake, okay? So be a Christian 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's the simplicity of a direction of life. Another word for simplicity is unaffectedness. And that means that the circumstances of life do not change the way that we live. For Christ. And Paul dealt with this with the Galatians church. Go with me quickly because we got to get finished. Galatians chapter 4, verses 12 through 18. Again, here's Paul who is given teaching, and then all it seems like at verse 12, he just snaps into this father figure in Galatians chapter 4, verse number 12. In Galatians chapter 4, verse number 12, it says, Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first, and my temptation which is in my flesh ye despise not, or rejected. But receive me as uh, an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear you record that if, I had been po if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Am I therefore become an, your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that ye might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I am present with you. So what's saying there? Paul's saying, listen, I'm the same as you. You got saved by the grace of God. Do you, did you forget that? In fact, do you remember there was a time where you guys were so sympathetic towards me and the affliction that I had, you would have took out your own eyes to help me if you could. And he goes, now I've not changed. I've not changed my message. I've not changed my manner of life. I've not changed anything. How am I now your enemy for preaching the same exact message that I have for all these years? And he says, matter of fact, he goes further and he says, uh, he says, I tell you the truth. They zealously affect you, but not well. These people are affecting you and they're doing it zealously. They're doing it with great passion. He goes, but it's not helpful to you. It's not profitable. Matter of fact, it's pulling you away from the things of God and the truth of God. He says, yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. He says, basically, as a matter of fact, if you were acting like them and you were taking your godliness and your godly influence and your spirituality and affecting them, they'd kick you out. 
because they don't want genuine spirituality. They want religion, they want what they want, and you're not going to talk them out of it. You know how many times I've had this conversation with people? Those people aren't your friends. Listen, I know you want to go to that church because they have this or that, but I'm just telling you, that's the direction it's going in. And only the Spirit of God can reveal these things. I know Paul's telling these things. He wants them to get it. But I'm going to tell you right now, the people that he wrote to, not everybody, I guarantee you, got it. Some did, but some didn't. Paul had this heart for them. He says, you cannot be affected by this world. Simplicity and sincerity is unaffectedness unaffected by the, the, the whims and, and wishes of this world. The Lord Jesus was the greatest example of not allowing people and people's anger and people's threats and the danger around him to ever move him. What was Jesus only moved by or with? Compassion. It says he was moved with compassion on people. Jesus had a focus on what he had to do and what he was here to do. Matter of fact, did he not rebuke Peter when he began to tell them how his life was going to end up and Peter didn't like what he heard? Go with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. In Matthew 16, verses 21 through 23, when Peter tried to stop this process, Jesus rebuked him. In Matthew 16, verses 21 through 23, it says, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those be of men. In other words, I am here, Peter, to do what my father has sent me to do, be here to do. And you may not like it. And it's not going to sound pretty. And guess what? It's not going to look pretty, and it's not going to be pretty, but it's for you. And he rebuked, and he says, get, me, get thee behind me, Satan. In other words, if you're going to try to stop the work of Almighty God, I'm going to equate you with the one who wants to do that, and his name is Satan. Nothing was going to deter Christ because he was, had single-mindedness unaffectedness about what he was doing. You and I need to have that. That would be the simplicity of the Christian life. Just keeping our eyes fixed. Looking unto Jesus. That is, that's faith. That is a definition of faith. Looking unto Jesus. The author and finisher of our faith. That's the definition of it. Now the description is found in 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Given some things not seen. We should send a direction, but it's also in the dictating. Paul was not slamming himself or questioning the ability God had given him, but he is merely confirming that he does not need to dress up the gospel to look better. The gospel in is, is attractive in itself. Look what he says in 2 Corinthians 11. Uh, he says in uh, verse number 6, But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. Have I committed an offense in abasing self that ye might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? Notice he says that word rude. In other words, his words may not seem flowing. They may not seem effervescent. They may not be attractive to people, but it's true. And it's what needed to be said. And I believe Paul says this knowing he's following the Holy Spirit. Well, there's a danger because Paul will reiterate this same exact thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in wisdom of men, but the, in the power of God. Listen, don't ever find yourself when you're listening to somebody preach on the radio or you're listening to preaching here, no matter if it's myself or Adam or Aaron or Brother Harp or Gary or whoever's preaching, and say, I don't like what that man is saying. If it's from the Bible, your job is not to care if you like it or not. Your job is to say, okay, Lord, how can I apply this to my life? Amen. How can it help me live better? Amen. Now, if they give me an opinion, you're certainly free to not like that. But if it's from the Bible... And that's what the Bible says. He says, I'm not trying to give you worldly wisdom. I'm not trying to, to pat your back. I'm just trying to give you spirit-led truth. And the simplicity is that 
of in life is the direction we live and the dictation that we listen to from the Bible. We must take the word of God as just that. If I could say this in the simplest form, say what you mean, mean what you say. James 5.12 says, But above all things, my brethren, swear not neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Now, the simplicity of the Christian life is found in simply following Christ with a yes, not wavering, simply trusting. Stop bringing ourselves into the equation to add complexity to our life. Stop making reasons or uh, concessions for why we live the way we live. Start following the Bible. And don't, don't live your life, I'm going to say this, please don't take it the wrong way, but don't live your life in ignorance. Don't assume you think you know something because that's the way it's always been. Remember what they said in Acts? He says they searched the scriptures to find out if these things were so. That's our responsibility. We have been, listen, we have an advantage that the people we read on the Bible did not have. We have the entire word of God right here in our hands. So there's no reason that we should live in ignorance. Listen to the word of God. It is the simplicity of the Christian life in love, in preaching, in the direction of our life. Live the simple life by saying yes to the Lord. Let's pray together, shall we? Uh, Father, I thank you for the preaching.